For more than 20 years, a handful of U.S. Air Force personnel have been haunted by an event that took place in the Rendlesham Forest, just outside their base in Suffolk, England. They maintain that for two nights in 1980, they experienced, up close, an encounter with an unidentified craft. Their accounts make the Rendlesham incident one of the most detailed and well-documented to date. These witnesses also say that the government launched an investigation and then tried to cover it up. This event has an eerie similarity to a sighting nearly 33 years earlier when an extraterrestrial spacecraft allegedly crashed near a military base in Roswell, New Mexico. Both stories involve eyewitness accounts from respected officers, government investigations, and classified records and evidence. This really was the holy grail. This was certainly Britain's most famous UFO case. There's no doubt about it. This is Britain's Roswell. It appears to be moving a little bit this way. It's coming this way. It is definitely coming this way. This is unreal. What really happened in the woods outside the Woodbridge Bentwaters Air Base in December 1980? If you contact the Pentagon about what happened December 1980 at RAF Woodbridge, England, they're going to tell you right now nothing happened there. People need to step up to the plate and say something. It happened, and it was real, and someone else visited Rendlesham Forest in 1980. This is Bentwaters Royal Air Force Base. Located 70 miles northeast of London, the now dormant site was once a highly sophisticated military installation. The main function of the twin bases there was to uh, support the NATO effort on, in case of a, a war in Europe. We would go ahead and uh, mobilize our A-10 aircraft to uh, support uh, whatever war effort we were told to do. In 1980, with Cold War tensions near their peak, Bentwaters and nearby Woodbridge air bases are operated by about 12,000 U.S. Air Force personnel, making it one of the largest NATO complexes in all of Europe. But the site, bordered by the dense Rendlesham Forest, has a secret. This was Bentwaters' weapons storage area. Exactly what was kept here is officially classified. But researchers and observers agree that a massive nuclear arsenal was stockpiled beneath these concrete bunkers. The extraordinarily secured underground bunkers with alternating layers of steel, concrete, earth, steel, concrete, earth, held something like 300,000 kilotons of nuclear ordnance. The American airmen who manned this base are highly skilled. They're trained to deal with life and death situations with a cool, clear head. And that makes the events at Rendlesham even more mysterious, because what they saw on Christmas night, 1980, made these thick-skinned military men shudder with fear. It's 3 a.m. Airman John Burroughs is patrolling the east gate of Woodbridge Air Base, part of his normal routine as a security policeman. Security did the airfields, weapon storage areas, and stuff like that. You control the entry of the base. The 20-year-old has been with the Air Force for almost two years and has been stationed at Bentwaters for about a year and a half. Tonight, there is nothing to observe but the stars overhead. It was cold that night. It was a clear night, pretty much. You know, it was a clear night. There's a little bit of fog. As he's walking, his superior, Bud Stevens, pulls up in a truck. He tracked me down and said, let's ride around for a while. The men drive into Rendlesham Forest. Suddenly, Sergeant Stevens notices a strange light in the woods just off the road. He said, whoa, is that normal? And I looked out and it was just a weird glow in the woods. I said, no, it's not normal. Burroughs can't shake a bad feeling. You know, he just felt a real sense of danger or something wasn't right. There were different colored lights, you know, like you see on a Christmas display, different colored lights that were blinking on and off. Alarmed, the men speed back to the gate to call the flight desk from a secure phone line. 
They do not want to broadcast the information over their radios. At Burroughs' insistence, the call is transferred to the base's Central Security Control, or CSC. The shift commander dispatches 26-year-old Sergeant Jim Penniston to the site. Penniston has been a security policeman with the Air Force for seven years. They told me I need to go out the East Gate. We have a situation out there. I said, what type of situation? He said, well, I'd rather have the on-scene patrolman tell you what that is. And I says, well, can I wait? No, you got to get out immediately. Within minutes, Penniston and his driver arrive at the East Gate. Burroughs and Stevens direct his attention to the woods. I seen this multicolor, uh, yellow and red. It was about, you know, two, three hundred meters away. And it looked like an aircraft crash immediately. That's the color that you get from uh, titanium and fuel burning. Penniston calls back to CSC and gets clearance to investigate a possible downed aircraft. If it is an aircraft crash, we can go ahead and, uh, you know, render assistance and uh, set up security for it. As part of standard procedure, Sergeant Penniston tries to gather information from Bud Stevens. And I said, well, do you hear it crash? Bud, he said, no, it didn't crash. It landed. Stevens is too frightened to help with the investigation. He returns to his post, while Burroughs and Penniston proceed without him. Soon after, they speed off with a driver and head toward the mysterious light. When they can no longer maneuver the vehicle around the dense trees, Burroughs and Penniston proceed on foot. They walk about 50 meters and notice strong interference on their radios. The farther we got into the woods, the, it became more and more inter, intermediate, where it was harder and harder to talk to them. Suddenly, Sergeant Penniston feels an electrical charge in the air. I've been in excitable situations before uh, on duty, and um, I know the adrenaline feeling, but this here was different. You could feel it on your clothes, your face, your hair. The closer they move toward the light, the less the scene resembles a crash. It didn't have no smell of smoke, and uh, it was too contained. It was just like one ball out there. And we came into a clearing, and then that's when it was like a bright light lit up the whole area. It was almost blinding. Sergeant Penniston moves within 10 feet of the object, and the bright light dims. As his eyes adjust, he has trouble understanding what he's seeing. I'm a rational person. I wanted a rational explanation of what was going on. I could not come up with one. Penniston snaps pictures with his military-issued camera. The craft was triangular in shape uh, and measured uh, probably nine feet wide by about eight feet high. I couldn't tell the front or back to it. I mean, there was no uh, engines on one side or no cockpit or nothing like that. It was all completely smooth, the outside of the craft. He then circles the object, writing descriptions in a notepad. These are the notes he wrote that night. Surface is unknown. Identity unknown. No apparent landing gear present. No sound, but appears to be operating somehow. Peniston's handwriting changes dramatically as he gets closer to the craft. I, I was really having problems with the, the type of craft I keep, I keep saying this, I'm, I, I have a problem with understanding what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm recording here. When he draws near enough, he reaches out and touches the object. The fabric of the craft was smooth, like glass. It was uh, warm to the touch, but not hot. There was like lights on it. it was, somehow it was in the fabric of the craft. On the front side of the object, Penniston notices several strange symbols. He copies them in his notebook as well. They were like markings, uh, not uh, numbers, not language. There were several, maybe six symbols uh, measuring three feet wide. I wasn't trained for uh, what I was experiencing. Suddenly, the object emits a blinding flash of light. 
the men take cover. Then the object, whatever it was, lifted up, went up, and then moved back away over the trees. The speed of the craft leaving the area was, uh, I guess the best way to describe it is probably uh, in a blink of an eye. I've never seen any craft move that fast in my uh, entire Air Force career. And uh, I don't think I ever will again. As the men slowly rise to their feet, their attention is drawn by another flash of light through the trees. At first, they assume it is the craft, but on second glance, they realize it is the Orford Nest Lighthouse, five miles away. Burroughs and Penniston check their radios. They're working again. It is now around 5 a.m., roughly two hours since they first spotted the mysterious lights in the woods. They contact the CSC, and their commander orders them to rendezvous with a security team back at the East Gate. So we were like, what are we going to say? What, you know, what, we can't explain what we saw. We can't explain what just happened. Later that morning, the men are brought in for debriefing. Penniston is reluctant to divulge everything he witnessed. It was not a good career move to report exactly what we seen. I went into the shift commander's office with uh, Burroughs, and uh, we uh, gave a sanitized briefing of, of what happened that night. After the debriefing, Penniston says the shift commander issues him a thinly veiled warning. Gentlemen, he says, uh, Project Blue Book ended in 1969, and sometimes things are best left alone. Project Blue Book was the code name for the U.S. Air Force's controversial UFO investigation unit. During the course of our investigation... Before it was disbanded, its goal was to determine if UFOs were a potential threat to national security. Despite his commander's warning, Sergeant Penniston can't put the strange encounter out of his mind. I got back to my house and I couldn't go to sleep. I'd probably uh, sat around the house for maybe two or three hours. And finally I said, well, I, I got to go back out there. He returns to the site with some plaster of Paris. His plan? To make casts of any indentations left by the craft. I wasn't going to leave there until I had answers. I wanted something tangible. He spots three round impressions in a symmetrical pattern on the ground. They are a few inches deep and roughly 10 feet apart. They measured exactly the same distance apart, each of the pods, approximately two to three inches thick. These are the casts made by Penniston the morning after his sighting. He believes they show the marks left by the craft when it landed on the forest floor. He decides not to show them to his superiors. Along with his notes and roll of film, the sergeant now has the three plaster molds to help back up his story. But Penniston's physical evidence doesn't solve the mystery of Rendlesham. Just two nights later, the UFO returns. And this time, the deputy base commander makes a chilling record of his own encounter. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. Late December, 1980. Sightings of a mysterious craft at the Woodbridge Bentwaters NATO complex in Suffolk, England, have put many airmen on edge. The strange encounters began the night of the 25th, when airmen reported seeing unusual lights. By the early morning hours of the 26th, two men claimed to have come within a few feet of a landed craft in the neighboring forest. It's now the evening of the 27th. 40-year-old Deputy Base Commander, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt, attends a holiday party at the Officers Club. His celebration is cut short when one of his men arrives looking distressed. He showed up just white as a sheet. And he wasn't the type of uh, person to get too excited too easily. He was a former Marine. He said, it's back. We looked at each other and said, what's back? He said, the UFO. After two nights of disturbing stories, Holt decides to investigate for himself. The police were spending more time looking in the sky than they were at the airplanes they were supposed to be protecting. It's time to put this to rest. 
Holt instructs a three-man security team to assemble their gear and meet him at his quarters. Within minutes, they head toward the Rendlesham Forest. By the time Holt arrives, a security cordon has been established around the perimeter of the woods. Holt is briefed on the situation and is told that the UFO is no longer visible. But the men are experiencing mysterious outages in their high-powered floodlights, called light halls. Holt and his team collect their gear, a still camera, a Geiger counter for measuring radiation, and a night vision device called a starscope. I took my small personal cassette recorder, which I carry just about everywhere with me, just to record the events. The team heads into the dark woods. And I was going to investigate and show that there was definitely a good, a good reasonable explanation for everything. The following is the recording Halt made that night. 150 feet or more from the initial, I should say, suspected impact point. Heavy little difficulty, we can't get the light all to work. There seems to be some kind of mechanical problem. Along with the malfunctioning light halls, Halt's team encounters the same radio interference experienced by Burroughs and Penniston two nights prior. They are walking through the area where Burroughs and Penniston reported seeing the unidentified craft when Holt notices gashes in the bark of several trees. It looks as if they have been struck by a large object. Holt orders one of his men to take photographs. He took pictures of the indentations of the trees and everything. He was taking snap, snap, snap all the time. The Geiger counter begins registering high levels of radiation, but only in the areas surrounding the alleged landing site. Suddenly, the dark woods are alive with sound. We're hearing very strange sounds out of the farmers burning our animals. They're very, very active, making an awful lot of noise. All the animals in the forest were acting up, making a lot of noise. And the barnyard animals from the farm, which was on the adjacent side of the particular location, were also acting up. One of his men points out a glowing light in the distance. With his tape recorder rolling, Halt documents every moment of this encounter. You just saw a light yes, there. Where? Right on this position here. Straight ahead in between the tree. There it is again. Watch. Straight ahead off my flash back there. Yeah, sir. There it is. Hey, I see it too. What is it? We don't know, sir. Sir, what is it? We saw this bright red glowing object. It looked like an eye. It's the best way I can describe it. It was bright red, had a dark center and appeared like as though we were winking. We're about 150 or 200 yards from the site. Everything else is just deathly calm. There is no doubt about it. There's some type of strange flashing red light ahead. There's yellow. I saw a yellow tinge in it, too. Weird. It, it, it appears to be maybe moving a little bit this way. Yes, it's brighter than it has been. Yellow. It's coming this way. Oh, it is definitely coming this way. It was moving through the trees horizontally, but also traveling vertically. In other words, it was zigzagging through the trees and dripping what appeared to be, best way I can describe it, as molten metal. Holt and his men pursue the object into a nearby field. As we approached, it receded. It went away from us. It went out into the farmer's field. It stayed there for probably 20, 30 seconds, maybe a little more. Pieces of it are showing off. There is no doubt about it. This is weird and then it silently exploded and broke into multiple white objects. So we went into the field and searched around on the ground looking for burnt marks or evidence of whatever was coming off the object. The men find nothing in the field. Overhead, the object makes a sudden turn. It approached us at very, very high speed. Oh, hey, here, here he comes from the south. He's coming toward us now. It stopped overhead and sent down a beam. The best way I can describe it is like a laser beam. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. This is unreal. It was a steady, constant beam as far as the diameter. It fell at our feet, and we all just were in awe. And I thought, was it trying to signal? Is it trying to warn us? Is it threatening us? 
And just as suddenly as it appeared, the light went click and was off. The object speeds away. The team watches, mesmerized, as it moves over the base and continues to beam lights to the ground. To some, it appears that the light is beaming directly into the base's weapon storage area, where nuclear missiles are reportedly housed. There's one object still hovering over Woodbridge Base at about 5 to 10 degrees off the horizon, still moving erratic and similar lights and beaming down this area. At this point, Holt's recorder runs out of tape. A craft is still hovering in the distance, but Holt and his team aren't sure what to do next. There's no protocol for what they've just encountered. Unnerved and exhausted, the men head back to base. Airman John Burroughs, who had witnessed a UFO two nights earlier, arrives at the site, along with Sergeant Adrian Bustinza. Burroughs is immediately concerned by the behavior of the men returning from the field. They were kind of, I don't know, they were weird. I mean, they were upset. After a brief conversation, Burroughs spots a blue light glowing in the same clearing Halt has just examined. The airman is determined to investigate further. I was bugging him, come on, Colonel, let me go out and see. I mean, I want to see what it is. So he finally authorized myself and Bastenza to go forward to, to get a closer look. The men head toward the strange blue glow in the field. Adrenaline quickly takes over, and Burroughs breaks into a run. As I was getting close to whatever it was, all of a sudden it was gone. The field is thrown into darkness, leaving the airmen scared and confounded. This was gone, and I'm standing out in the field, and there was nothing. Burroughs turns to Bastenza in disbelief. And he goes, I, what happened to you? And I go, I don't know what you're talking about. He goes, and you were, like, involved in the lights. He said, you were just like... It was like, all of a sudden, you were there, and then you were in the lights, and you were gone. Burroughs and Bustenza return to base. Burroughs' second encounter with the bizarre lights leaves him with nothing but questions. They are unaware that a sweeping investigation involving covert government agencies is already underway. The men claim that as they headed back to the base that night, they were walking into a government conspiracy. January 1981. Rumors are swirling around the Woodbridge Bentwaters air bases in eastern England after mysterious UFOs are sighted by the U.S. Air Force personnel stationed there. Many of them were, were some years into their tour of duty. These were highly trained witnesses. It's not as if they'd all just turned up there the night before. The military investigation that followed remains controversial to this day. Those who say they witnessed the UFOs believe the military was more interested in damage control than in finding the truth. What our government did in the name of secrecy to these individuals is absolutely shameful. According to these airmen, they soon became unwilling participants in a government cover-up. Initially, the investigation follows standard military procedure. Deputy Base Commander Charles Halt a witness himself, begins debriefing the airman who reported seeing the craft. I had no choice. I couldn't ignore it. There were so many witnesses and so many people at so many different places. John Burroughs, who witnessed the UFOs on both nights, says his interview is clear-cut. He took our statements, kind of looked at them, said it was really a wild thing, and there's really no explanation for what's going on, and that's how it was kind of left. Others, like Sergeant Jim Penniston, say that after their meeting with Halt, a long and disturbing process begins. Two weeks after his initial interview, Penniston is called for another debriefing. This time, it is with a high-ranking team of investigators, the OSI. The OSI is the Office of Special Investigations. It's, uh, how shall I say, the, the discreet police is one way to put it. And they are there to police the US Air Force. And they can actually walk into the, an office of a general and, you know, even arrest him, if you like. That's how powerful they are. When Penniston enters the room, the mood is ominous. He begins to give a statement and offers the investigators sketches and notes of his encounter. According to Penniston, 
the rest of the interview is a blur. To this day, he has a difficult time recalling precisely what tactics the OSI used to extract his information. They took extra steps to make sure I was telling the truth. Sodium pathol, I'm sure I gave a release for that. And hope that they understood that everything I said was the truth. I think, I, I believe I gave my permission for that, I would think. To Peniston, the military's investigation takes on a sinister tone as more men are called in for questioning. Shortly after the event, Sergeant Adrian Bustinza, who had accompanied John Burroughs to the field, is led to a room beneath the base for questioning. Even now, Bustinza refuses to speak publicly about the events of that night. According to author Georgina Bruni, he later confided in her. They said to him, look, you know, what you saw was a light from the, the local lighthouse. And he said, no, no, I saw much more than that. It was more than that. No, you don't get the picture, do you? And they would not let him go until he agreed that what he saw was the lighthouse. And the moment they said to him, bullets are cheap, a dime a dozen, is when he said, okay, it was the lighthouse. Other witnesses also say they are told to drop their stories about seeing a UFO. We were told that we couldn't talk about it, was to treat it as top secret, and that was it. We never talked about it. According to Airman Burroughs, the signs of a government cover-up are obvious. Shortly after his interrogation, Burroughs is back on guard duty. As he makes his rounds, he can see that the woods are bustling with activity. There was vehicles leaving Woodbridge going out into the forest. There was helicopters flying around out there, so there was some stuff going on out there. Exactly what, I don't know. Deputy Base Commander Charles Halt is also aware of covert activities going on at the base. I heard some stories that were substantiated by several people that uh, a plane load of people did come in a day or so later and did do a lot of investigating. Peniston and Holt claim they took pictures of the mysterious craft they encountered. But when the prints return from the base's photo lab, they are blank. The pictures are whited out, most of them. Uh, I thought that was really uh, unusual. And I believe that the photos that I got were intentionally just whited out photographs. That's what I believe. Even Lieutenant Colonel Halt, the highest ranking eyewitness, believes he is being kept in the dark by the military. As the investigation continues, he's asked to type up a memo based on his interviews with other witnesses and submit it to his superiors. Halt's understanding is that the document will be shared with the British government. Halt does as he is told, and submits a memo entitled, Unexplained Lights. He writes, the individuals reported seeing a strange glowing object in the forest. The object was described as being metallic in appearance and triangular in shape. It is not a definitive report. Many of the details are missing or incorrect, and the descriptions at times are vague. The memo was not meant for public consumption. It was meant as a tickler, if you will, to the Ministry of Defense to get them involved to do a proper investigation. His superiors filed the memo away, and the strange lights never returned to the base. Eventually, rumors of an extraterrestrial craft die down. For three years, the public is kept in the dark about what happened at the air bases. Then, in 1983, a new witness surfaces with a startling claim about the UFO encounter, one that will only deepen the mystery of Rendlesham. October 2nd, 1983. The British Sunday tabloid, News of the World, hits newsstands with the headline, UFO lands in Suffolk, and that's official. The article claims that a mysterious craft moving under intelligent control invaded the skies above the Woodbridge-Bentwaters air bases in late December 1980. 
But most intriguing is the offering of a piece of written evidence, an official U.S. Air Force memo confirming the alleged sightings. The document was written by one of the men who encountered the mysterious object, Deputy Base Commander Charles Holt. Every local radio, TV station, Japanese TV, German TV, I had people swarming all over the place wanting to know the real story. From there onwards, every single newspaper in the United Kingdom was featuring this story for about a week. The memo, titled Unexplained Lights, offers a brief description of the late December encounters. It includes Jim Penniston's description of a strange object that maneuvered through the trees as well as Halt's account of a red, sun-like object in the night sky. But how was the story leaked to the public? The document, known as the Halt Memo, was brought to light by Larry Warren, a former Air Force security policeman at Bentwaters. He's blunt when he explains why he did it. I wanted to drag people right by their hair through the thing and say, this happened. He was the one, the one, who brought this whole thing to public attention. It was his information specifically that resulted in a Freedom of Information Act that resulted in the release of the so-called HALT document. And once that single sheet of paper was out, the toothpaste was out of the tube. Warren has received both praise and criticism for his candidness. The story he tells begins like the others, but the ending is even more bizarre. In late 1980, Warren was a 19-year-old security policeman stationed at Bentwaters. According to Warren, after midnight on December 29th, he is removed from his post and ordered to the woods to assist with Colonel Halt's investigation. When he reaches a clearing, he sees a group of military personnel surrounding a glowing object. In this field was this object on the ground. It's like a science fiction movie, but there was something alive associated with it. It didn't come out any doors. There were no windows. It was this thing, and it was changing all the time. As he draws within a few feet of the craft, Warren says he witnesses an amazing sight. There are officers and airmen facing the object, and three small glowing entities standing in the light. What he observes and the other men observe that are in proximity is three humanoid shapes. There was something separate from it with these uh, three, what you would perceive as kids. Warren then watches as a senior officer begins communicating with the beings. The senior people there seemed to be following like a protocol. It seemed to be there was a procedure. Warren is then pulled from the clearing. He's given no explanation for what he's just seen. The next day, he says he is brought into a room with other witnesses for debriefing. He remembers a film projector and three men in suits. They showed us the different films of UFO military activity going back probably, I don't know, the 40s. Like other witnesses, Warren says the more he is questioned, the more distorted his memories become. He remembers what happens next as a series of scenes that make little sense. Warren recalls being taken against his will by men in dark suits, then being led to an underground facility on the base. I remember being on a table and people talking to me and, you know, doctors and Air Force people behind them. I have another memory of being in a kind of like a mess hall and trying to eat something and kind of being alone at a table. It's imagery. I mean, this could all have been plugged into my head. Warren says he isn't sure if what he remembers is real or if these images were planted by military investigators in order to confuse him and distract him from what really occurred. After the Rendlesham story breaks, Warren's accusations infuriate other witnesses. These airmen and officers say they too want the truth revealed, but that Warren's story is anything but. It hurt the whole incident as far as this is, something really did happen to us, but there's no way, the way he was describing it, what happened to us, and it wasn't fair to the people who were involved to have that kind of extreme stuff come out. Parts of his story do correspond with other eyewitness accounts. Warren, like Charles Halt and Jim Penniston, recalls seeing a glowing craft in the clearing of the Rendlesham Woods 
shortly after Christmas 1980. But Larry Warren is the only airman who claims he saw alien life forms. Another problem with Warren's version of events is that no one can remember seeing him in the woods on the night in question. Nobody ever recalls him being out there that night. Nobody I've ever, I've talked to all the players and just about everybody was on the, uh, even the fringes and nobody remembers seeing Larry Warren anywhere except around the base in training. Warren remains steadfast in his convictions. I've never lost a minute's sleep over my role in this. I've never intentionally misrepresented anything, lied or tried to gain anything uh, unfairly. The contradictions surrounding the Rendlesham case have proven frustrating for UFO researchers. While there are multiple credible witnesses, airmen trained to be good observers and remain calm under extreme circumstances, the discrepancies between their stories are difficult to ignore. In the years that follow, researchers struggle to unravel the mystery. Then, in 2002, Declassified government files reveal new facts about those mysterious nights in the woods. And which could have been the spot where the alien craft landed. Since 1983, the Rendlesham UFO incident has garnered attention around the world. But to this day, there is still no explanation for what U.S. Air Force personnel claimed they saw in the woods and skies of Suffolk, England. Some experts who have reviewed the reports of strange lights and a glowing spacecraft have concluded that these sightings are a simple case of optical illusion. Retired Air Force Major and astronomer James McGehee learned about the incident by chance. I first heard about the Rendlesham Forest case in 1983 when I was at the base uh, conducting a military exercise there on temporary duty. During his tour, he discovers that five miles from the twin bases, on the shores of the North Sea, sits the Orford Ness Lighthouse. McGehe feels that witnesses mistook this lighthouse for a UFO. If you're out in a dark sky on a cold night in December, and a lighthouse is swinging through the trees, with this bright beam of light passing through the trees, it's going to have some strange, unusual effects. Light is going to get scattered by the trees. John Burroughs did mention this lighthouse in his first statement to his superiors. In the report, he says that after the mysterious lights disappeared, he thought the lighthouse was another craft, but quickly realized his mistake. I want to clarify something. I've always, this is always somebody who tries to twist it. If you read the statement, especially mine, it clearly distinguishes between what we saw at the beginning and then we did see a beacon light and we followed it. Nowhere in my statement does it say, I felt the beacon light was the object. I've done a whole lot of research on this lighthouse. You know, you can talk about it from here to eternity. And there's absolutely no way that a lighthouse can travel five miles, go in and out of trees, shoot beams down to the ground, so anyway, it's not a lighthouse. But McGehe claims there is a second explanation for the lights in the sky that has nothing to do with UFOs. On the night of the 25th, at around uh, 9.30 in the evening, a Cosmos satellite re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. It would have looked like a fireball, which is a very, very bright meteor. For nearly 20 years, skeptics and believers continue their search for answers. In 2002, thanks in part to researchers like Georgina Bruni, the British government finally releases a new set of records. The files provide additional information about the case, but also raise new questions. They make it clear that the British government investigated the mysterious sightings back in 1981. This fact seems to indicate that military investigators did not believe the sightings were caused by a lighthouse or a satellite. But the files also reveal some of the shortcomings of that investigation. We discovered that some of the radar facilities were actually faulty. The cameras were faulty on the nights in question, or allegedly 
faulty that the films were missing. At the time, investigators based their research on the original memo written by Lieutenant Colonel Charles Holt. His document states that the first event occurred on December 27th, but the sightings actually began on the 25th. Holt's mistake has caused researchers to examine the wrong nights for 20 years. It is a frustrating revelation for Nick Pope, an official with the Ministry of Defense. Here we had possibly the most significant UFO event ever to have taken place on British soil. And yet, not only were the dates wrong, but uh, crucial days had been lost. Moreover, much has been left out of the files. Researchers hope the US and British governments will release further information, including pictures taken by Air Force personnel on the nights of the sightings. These are the only photographs that remain from the investigation. They show authorities examining the alleged landing site, but the pictures reveal no evidence of a landed craft. The U.S. Air Force's official stance is that the events were no threat to national security. To many, this statement doesn't ring true. If, in fact, nuclear weapons were housed at the base, then the military would have been very concerned about reports of an unidentified aircraft. We had objects flying over the weapon storage area, shining beams down to the ground. If that ain't defense significance, what is? Skeptics grapple with the same question, but in their minds, the military's response bolsters their claim that UFOs did not visit the Rendlesham Forest. This was during the Cold War. You have to realize that security was fairly tight. Anything that would happen uh, near the flight line when you have these high value asset aircraft, tactical aircraft, or in weapons areas would immediately cause a response by the entire base. Everybody on the base would have been woken up and been reacting to something like that. And of course, that didn't happen. Even Charles Holt, the deputy base commander, is frustrated with his search for answers. I kept prodding Squadron Leader Moreland, the British liaison officer, for an answer. Doesn't somebody care? Doesn't, isn't somebody interested? I got the feeling that I was kind of left hanging out there to dry, if you know what I mean. Though they continue to press the government for more information, some researchers believe that the missing files and early mistakes in the military investigation may leave the Rendlesham case a lasting mystery. In any investigation, whatever you're investigating, if you don't, if you don't really use the first 24 hours to try and chase it down, your chances of success diminish rapidly. The problem with the Rendlesham incident is that this happened over the Christmas period. A lot of the key personnel were on leave, and uh, I th think there was a, a bit of a decision-making vacuum. The newly released information is not enough for the men involved at Rendlesham to put the incident to rest. For now, they possess the few pieces of intriguing evidence that remain from their strange encounter. Peniston's plaster casts and drawings. Holt's tape recording. We're about 150 or 200 yards from the site. Everything else is just deathly calm. Jim Peniston, Larry Warren, and John Burroughs continue to wonder why the government is hiding the truth. There's a chain of command, there's a chain of custody, everything's kept track of. And for this stuff to play it like it disappeared and it's gone, it's not. I guess technically we were part of a cover-up to ourselves. We probably started it by sanitizing it, the initial report. Like John Lennon used to say, conspiracy is silence speaks louder than words, and that's a fact. And I'll be pissing off people as long as I can about this and screaming that uh, this went down, take a look at it then judge for yourself. In America, everyone's heard of Roswell, but um, only the UFO uh, researchers really know about this case. And yet, in many ways, I consider this case to be bigger than Roswell. This could be the biggest UFO incident of all time. Let's put it where it deserves to be. Let's put it in people's minds. People keep telling me, well, what really happened? I don't know. What was it? I really don't know. I mean, I, I don't. These people will never be able to forget the terrifying lights in the sky.
or how they could not escape from the powerful beams of energy which seem to suck the life from their bodies. That is why they are sending us their warning about the night terrors of Brazil's Roswell on UFO Files, next on the History Channel.